All right, well, welcome. I want to say uh, welcome to any one of you students who might be brand new. Maybe you're here in this room and this is your first time in high school ministry. Uh, my name is Pastor Connor, and I'm the high school pastor here, and I'm just so glad that you're here. Uh, I know this can often be like this big group of students that you walk into like the first day of school. It can feel very weird. Uh, hopefully, I'll get a chance to meet you and make it a little bit more personal um, and have this be a place where you belong. Uh, that's my hope for each and every one of you guys. So if you guys want to grab your Bibles with me, we love to open up God's Word and hear from it every week uh, and turn to 1 John, where we're continuing on in our series called If You Know, You Know. If You Know, You Know. And the main series idea that we've been running with over the last several weeks is simply this. If you know what it's like to be changed by Jesus, then you know that you've been saved by Jesus. That's what we're talking about. We, we've actually gone through the book of 1 John and pulled out every indicator that the Apostle John, who wrote this letter, writes about to say, hey, these are the things that Jesus should be changing you in if you truly are being, have been saved by Jesus. So we're, we're pulling out these indicators to, to look at our life. And some of the ones that we've already talked about are things like community, who we spend our time with shows us that Jesus is really changing us. Our, our witness, whether, we, whether or not we talk about Jesus with other people. We, we talked about confession, how if we truly know Jesus, then we also know that we have sin in our life and we will regularly bring it before God in confession. We talked about the Holy Spirit, how if we truly are saved by Jesus, then we have the Holy Spirit in us. We will see evidences of the Spirit in our life. And last week, John talked about obedience. How if we truly know Jesus and are being changed by Jesus, then we will see obedience to God's law, to, to Jesus as something that's in our life. Now, as we continue on pulling out indicators like this throughout the book of 1 John, the one thing that we have talked about is that we need to know that it's not just one of these things. Like it's not like one of these things that makes it or breaks it, but it's all of these things together that we need to look at as a lens when we see our life to see if we're being changed by Jesus. John puts great importance on each and every one of these things. And as we continue on today, one of the things that John highlights, and actually is one of his greatest, his greatest emphasis throughout the book of 1 John is love. It's love. John's message today for us is that if, if we truly are being changed by Jesus, then the way that we love should look different. Throughout the letter of 1 John, love is actually mentioned nearly 50 times. In this short little book, 50 times. It's almost like he harps on it so much so that it's impossible for us to walk away and not get the idea that Jesus brings about a different kind of love in us. That if somebody has Jesus in their life, then they must also have love. That's how important this is to John. As we look at God's word today and the book of 1 John, 1 John really has two main things. Two, two main things that that is meant for you and me. It's either meant to convict us or to call us. For, for some of you guys here, as we study through this book, maybe there's points of conviction for you. Maybe there's something that stands out to you of like, wow, yes, I, I know I have Jesus in my life, but that, that is a reminder and a conviction of the way in which I need to be living and the way in which Jesus calls me to live that I need to grow in. Or for others of you, Maybe as we go through this, it's a call, a call to you to see that Jesus is worth giving your life to, that he actually brings about really good change in our life, good change that makes us the most happy when we give our life to him, when we trust in him and we follow him. And so that's ultimately what we're trying to do as we look through this book together. So with your guys' Bibles open, we're going to be reading 1 John chapter 2 starting in verse seven, and then we're gonna skip forward to chapter three as we go along. And so this is what John says today. He says, beloved, I'm writing to you 
No new commandment, but an old commandment that you've heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. And at the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him, in Jesus, and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And then skipping forward to chapter 3, verse 11, he continues the same idea. He says, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because, the, because we love the brothers. And whoever does love, or whoever does not love, abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. But by this we know love, that Jesus laid his life down for us. And we ought to lay our lives down for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. God, I just pray that as we unpack this, and as we understand what this looks like in our life, would you help us to walk away from today changed? Um, changed to look more like you. God, that's our simple prayer. It's in Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. All right, the main idea for specifically today is simply this. If God is love then everyone who truly knows God will love like he loves. Their love will be different, but not just different in any way, but it will start to look like Jesus' love. Last week, Pastor John talked about how our obedience to Jesus is this indicator in our life that we truly love God. And it's this week that the Apostle John actually unpacks this further by addressing what obedience to the second greatest commandment in all of the Bible looks like in our life, which is to love our neighbor as ourself. But before he unpacks this, what John actually looks towards first is he identifies this contrast. When we read this, we see this, this picture of light and darkness or death and life. He, he brings this contrast up, and what he's doing is he's acknowledging the opposite of love. He's saying in order for us to understand love, we also need to understand the opposite, which is hate. He simply says that anybody who hates his brother, who, who does acts of hatred or, or distaste or disfavor for those around them, they, they can't be of God. They can't be from God. You know, since the beginning of time, even all the way back to the first sibling rivalry relationship where we can see the most hatred happen. I have an older brother. Any of you guys who have siblings understand this. All the way back to Cain and Abel. John says, we can look around us and very quickly notice that the world is full of hate and anger. We see things like bullying in schools. Things like gossiping about one another to put each other down. We see degrading words on social media posts on pretty much anything that's debatable or controversial. We see grudges between friend groups, cliques in our schools. We see hateful words thrown about. And worst of all, maybe the purest form of hatred, we see these football rivalries go on that are just the worst. Like, I've never seen people more mad at each other than two fans from opposite teams. It's crazy. See, hatred... It shows up in little and it shows up in big ways in the world around us, doesn't it? Like we can't miss it. John actually calls these things, he calls these things darkness. He says these things are like darkness. And he says someone who has truly been saved by Jesus has actually passed out of this darkness. That, that they've come out of this darkness and they've come into the light. In chapter three, fourteen. He says that you know someone has passed from death to life or darkness to light if they show that they have love, if they show that they have love for others. Essentially what John is trying to say here is that if somebody has truly given their life to Jesus, 
and they truly have Jesus in their life, then a transformation, a, a transformation should have happened. That there should be a transformation, something different about them. Because Jesus, he not only turns us away from ways in which we used to live. Like oftentimes we think, oh, this person just came to Jesus. Yeah, they, they stopped doing things in life. But that's not all that Jesus is about. He calls us out of something, out of old ways of living, but he also calls us to brand new ways of living. Later in chapter four, John gets his point off strongest when he says this. He says, love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God, made a brand new creation, a new life, and they know God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. See, the indicator that we truly know Jesus is not actually that we just don't do any harm to those around us. John isn't saying like, if you know Jesus, you'll never do anything bad to people around you. That's not all he's saying here. He's saying, but people who know Jesus, they actually pursue other people in love in brand new ways that they did not before. There's actually something that is added to their life, not just taken away. And, And I believe John is helping us to distinguish the kind of love that comes from God from the kind of love that our world talks about. He's trying to answer the question, well, what does God look like in our life? What does God's love look like in our life? If we're being changed by him, how does it show up? What does this look like? And so he distinguishes it, God's love from all other kinds of love that we might know about. And so that's what we're gonna focus our time on today. In all this message, this is where we're going to plant ourselves: is look at the specific scriptures and verses that John says, hey, this is what God's love looks like. And if you want to know that God's love is in you, this is what you should be looking for. The first one that we're going to focus on is that John says God's love isn't one that just sits back and relaxes, but it's one that takes action. God's love, it takes action. In verse 18, he actually says, little children, let us not love in word or talk. Just telling people that we love them or or thinking about it, but let us love in deed and in truth. John says talk is cheap. The talk is cheap when we're talking about God's version of love. See, it's really easy to tell somebody that you love them. It's really easy to go around and say, oh, I love you. You're my favorite. You're my best friend in the world. But it's much harder It's much harder to actually show that kind of love, to to prove the words that we might say to someone around us. John says that God's love is a kind of love that goes after other people in our life. And it doesn't just remain as a thought. It's not just something that sits in our head. You know, back in in sixth grade, uh, little Connor had his first crush. I know, crazy to believe, had his first crush. And I remember this, like it was yesterday, I was at school, and, and there was this girl, it was my first crush, and like any sixth grade relationship, uh, it pretty much didn't really mean much of anything, and how it looked like was essentially, I would talk to her maybe once a week, like wave at her in the hallway, and like we, I, I tell all my buddies, like guys, like me and her, like we're, we're together, like we're a thing, you know, like we were, we were known as like the two that liked each other, that was it, and then I remember summer, uh, summer rolled around, uh, and at that time, my parents didn't allow me to have a phone. A lot of you guys have a phone. I didn't even have a phone at the time. I had like one of those tiny little iPods that looks like a literally miniature book, not even a book, like a tiny little thing compared to your guys' phones. So I had this tiny iPod and summer came around and naturally like we're not in school, so I'm not seeing my girl, you know? And, and throughout the whole summer, I like had maybe Snapchat, like one social media thing. And, and it was really hard and really inconvenient for me to message anyone because I had to like get on Wi-Fi and stuff. And so I never messaged her once. We never talked over Instagram or Snapchat or whatever. Like I was just like, yeah, like, you know, we're a thing. I was still to my buddies. So like, oh yeah, me and, me and her, like, we're still a thing. You know, we're, we're super tight and all this stuff. Like she's the best. And I remember we came back to school after a long summer and I'm walking down to lunch and my buddy comes up to me, he's like, hey, Connor, um, I got to tell you something, man. Yeah, Kaylin, um, she's not into you anymore. I was like, what? I was like, no, you're, you're kidding. You're, like, we're close. What do you mean? Like, we're like, th-. she's like, no. He's like, 
she doesn't like you anymore. She told me to tell you. Like, it was one of those things. She, to, she told him to tell me, and I was broken. I, like, my heart was crushed. I was like, what are we talking about? We were, we were tight. We were going to get married. It was going to be crazy, like everything. And, and I tell this story because I think it's so funny. My heart was broken. But I think it's so funny because this was my picture of love at that time. It was this very immature picture of what I thought love was. And why did 11-year-old Connor's form of love clearly not work out for him? Well, it was because his idea of love at the end of the day wasn't real love. It wasn't actually real love. It had no action. There was no commitment. There was no sacrifice. It was all just emotions and talk, right? You know, I watched a documentary of someone going around asking people for their definition of love, asking people, hey, how would you define love? These are some of the things that people said. They said, oh, love is a state of understanding and accepting everyone. Or it's something that makes you extremely happy in who you are. Or it's, it's a passion for something, or it's an energy. Someone said, it's, it's you know, the love that, that we are all a part of. Love is like something that we are all a part of and everything is a part of. Somebody said it's, a, it's a, a, a sensation that you feel when you meet the one, like the one you were meant to be with. This is, this is what people in our world think about when they think about love. In summary, the world makes love out to be like this mystical force almost, like this invisible thing that you can't see that's just like runs everything. See, but the reality of this is that it drastically misses what love truly is. And how God defines love. You know, biblical love, God's love, it does include emotions. That is a piece of it. Because God has created our emotions and he's designed them as a part of the way that we feel. But biblical love is much more fully defined by scripture. Not as something that we feel, but actually something that we do. Love is not simply an invisible feeling, but it's a character trait of God. John actually says God is love. And it's something that can be seen in real and tangible ways in this world. John says that God doesn't leave us guessing as to what this love looks like, but he actually makes it ever clear in Jesus. He says in verse 9, In this the love of God was made manifest or shown among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. See, John says if you want to know what love looks like, you need to look at Jesus. Look at his life, the way he lived, the way he showed patience and kindness, the way he served the people around him, the way he pursued the outcasts and spent time with the brokenhearted. And ultimately, look at the way he gave his life. He gave his life for us on the cross. See, but God's plan was never for Jesus to be the end all to displaying his love for the world. It didn't start and stop with Jesus, but... Chapter 4, John goes on. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. He continues and says, We love God because he first loved us. We actually show love for God and love for others because God first loved us. See, Jesus' real and tangible love, it's actually meant to lead us, lead you and me, to go out and to love the people around us in the way that God showed his love towards us. From the very beginning, God's plan was that his character would not start and stop with Jesus, his character of love, but that it would be shown through you and I. How we interact with each other, how we talk to each other, how we live towards one another. Man, I think the the people in our life who are the hardest to love, maybe who we would call the unlovable, or those who are undeserving of our love. These are the people that John is talking about. The people in our life who are hardest to love, how do we love them? How does God's love in us show up in the way that we pursue those people? And are you close to G- are you so close to Jesus that you personally know how much he has loved you? Someone who was undeserving of his love? that you have a heart to love those in your life who are unlovable. 
Does the love in your life take action? Does it pursue other people? Or does it just sit back as a thought? Do the friends in your life only hear that you have love for them, that you love them? Or could they actually say, no, I, I see the ways in which you love me. I, I can see them tangibly. I experience the ways in which you have loved me. See, God's love is, is different than the world's because it shows up in our life as a consistent action towards other people. One of the ways that God's Love is actually put on action, John says, is when we look and see the needs of others and actually meet them. Which brings us to our second point. God's love is one that pursues the needs of others. See, John says in verse 17, he says, if anyone has the world's goods, has all these possessions, and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, then how can God's love abide in him? How can somebody both claim to know God but consistently overlook others who might be in need? You know, when we go on trips to places such as Mississippi, like we mentioned at the beginning, you'll often hear us say the phrase, hey, we're being the hands and feet of Jesus. You'll hear this often. And the reason for this is because we're trying to remind everyone on the team that when we serve the food to the needy, when we spend time praying for the people who need prayer, when we spend time caring for the sick or giving our money and our time to meet the needs of others, then what we're doing in that moment is we're putting God's love on display. We're trying to reflect who Jesus was, how he lived in another place of this world today. See, when we love like Jesus and we live like Jesus, we actually give the world a hint of who he was and who he came to be, and what he came to do. We as people, you know, we're often super blinded by our possessions, aren't we? Like if you think of all the stuff you have, your phone, your cool clothes, the cool car that you drive, whatever it might be, those things are often what we become blinded by. And I think this is true because we are often, and each of you are often taught by the world, that our possessions, the things that we have, these are things that are meant to make us happy. Like, like they exist in our life to make us happy. Every, every commercial that you see, every ad, all throughout social media, all these things, what it communicates to us is that, hey, you deserve this, you need this, and it's there to make you happy. Like that's the message that we receive. And often this leads to us being far too busy focusing on what we want and or what we think we need to be happier, that it blinds us from understanding how we can use those things to serve the people around us. You know, the world's way of love, it tells us to make sure that we treat ourself. Make sure that we love ourself first and foremost because self-love is the greatest form of love. See, but God's kind of love, it takes that and it flips it on its head says, no, 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 that is not at all what love is. It flips that upside down, and it says that the greatest form of love isn't actually self-love. It's not loving yourself, but the greatest form of love is A, a relationship with God, who is love, and then of love that puts others above yourself. The gospel message, it's one that actually tells that our greatest need in life isn't more stuff. It's not more possessions. It's not more success or more popularity that will make us happy. The gospel message actually tells us that our greatest need is to be met by a relationship with God. Our greatest need is that we don't know God, that we're we're far from him. We actually don't know what true love is and that we need a restored relationship with God. That's the greatest need that needs to be met. And it's this that John gets at. He says, if you truly find that need met in Jesus, and he truly becomes what a lot of us like to say as Christians, the Christian, he's like, oh, Jesus is my everything. He's my everything. I would do anything for Jesus. He's my life. He's my number one. If that is truly true about yourself, that he is everything you need, then John says all these other things in your life, such as your possessions, your time, your money, if those are no longer the thing that you most need, 
and they're everything to you, and Jesus becomes that, then those things become something that you can use to help love and care for the people around you, to help meet the practical needs of the people around you, because it's no longer something that is something you truly need to be happy. It was Jesus himself that actually taught that the happiest person in the world is someone who gives rather than receives. That's the happiest person. John says if your love for others doesn't show up as giving, those, giving to those in need, spending your time serving those around you, then how can you say that Jesus is your everything? How do we view our things? How do we view the possessions, our, our time and our money and our resources as a way to serve and, and love the people around us? This is God's love. It's one that pursues the needs of others. Lastly, God's love is distinct from the world's way of love in that it's sacrificial. It not only pursues other people or seeks to meet the need of other people, but it's sacrificial. It gives something up in order to love. See, God's love is one that lays something down in order to love someone else. John says in verse 16, by this we know love, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And so we also ought to lay our lives down for the brothers. See, Jesus, he gave his life in love for us so that we could have life and love the ways that he loved. Now, now John is not saying that the only way to love is by sacrificing your life, like dying for someone else. That's actually not what he's fully saying here. But rather, he's saying that Jesus' willingness to lay down even his very life tells us that God's love is one that looks like us giving up something of value to us. That's what God's love looks like. It looks like being willing to lay down our own wants, our own desires, our, our, our own treasures or things that are precious to us in order to love someone like Jesus loved us. In Philippians, we see that God's kind of love is one that actually places the interests of others. We, it actually looks at someone else and what they want, and it puts it above higher than what we want. It, it places the interests of others above our own. It's others-focused, and it's not self-focused. See, what John is saying here is that the more and more you come to know Jesus, the more you should realize uh, that life is not about you. Like if you're here and you know Jesus, one thing you should know, at least know whether it has reached your heart or not, is that life is not about you. You know, every person in this world that, that I've met who doesn't know Jesus, if I'm being honest, life is all about them. Like anyone who I've met who does not know Jesus, life is all about them. Everything they put their time, their money, their energy towards, in the end, it is all aimed towards meeting their wants, their desires, and their happiness. And it makes sense, right? It makes sense. Without Jesus, then life should be about us. We, we do all the things that we do, even the ones that seem as if it's for someone else, because we want to make our, our life better, our, our, meet our own happiness, but then it's when I'm surrounded by so many others who also know and love Jesus that I'm reminded um, that life isn't about me. I I'm reminded that life is not about me, but it's about Jesus and making Jesus known. You know, I love being a part of a life group. Me, me and Emily were a part of this young marriage life group. And I love being a part of it because what I get to see is I get to see a bunch of other Jesus followers who life is not about them. They clearly know Jesus. They know that Jesus is what their life is about, and it's not about them. I've gotten to be a part of this community where people actually give up their day in order to go help other people move into their home. They, they give up their plans to go grocery shopping for other people, meet their needs. They, they give up their own time to help babysit for another couple so that they could go on a date, spend some good time together. They, they give up things like their money, their hard-earned money, to help meet the needs of other people in our group. 
to help even maybe meet some sickness needs or some financial needs or just borrow maybe even a car. People give up their transportation in order that another person could get to work or go to the places that they need to go. These are all things that, that Emily and I have got to experience in this community of people who know and they love Jesus, people who are willing to give these things up that in an ordinary world, like you don't give those things up. Well, like why would you give those things up? See, John's saying here that God's love, it's one that gives up in order to love. What are some things that, that you could think of in your life that, that you have to give up in order to love? Are, are there ways in your life that you are willing to and or loose handed with the things in your life that you're, you're willing to give up in order to love someone, in order to pursue someone else? Love like Jesus loved. Does the love in your life tend to run out though? Whenever it gets to the point where it's like, oh wait, uh, I actually have to, I have to give up this or this person is asking this from me. In that moment, does your love run out or does it push through that and give those things up? Live a sacrificial like love in order to meet that person's needs or pursue that person in love. That's the kind of love that John says is God's love in us. It's upside down this world. All of these ways of love, it's upside down this world. It's not like the kind of love that we see. See, it's a life defined by love that resembles Jesus and that tells us that we truly know and are walking in close fellowship or relationship with Jesus. The more we get to know Jesus' love for us, the more it continually should rub off on us and ultimately overflow into the lives of the people around us. They should see Jesus in you. They, they should see Jesus' love in you. That's the kind of love that John says gives us confidence. It actually bolsters our confidence that we truly have Jesus in our life. We're truly saved by Jesus because he's changing even the ways in which we love so my question to leave you guys with today is simply this. Is your life marked by this upside down type of love? Is it marked by this kind of love? You know, if it is, then just like what John is hoping to get out of writing to us in this text, his hope is that you would grow in confidence that if you see Jesus' love in you, that you can grow in confidence and say, I know Jesus, I'm saved by him, and I'm gonna be with him. It should increase our confidence, but it should also probably convict us, right? Because we don't always love like Jesus loves. It should convict us to continue to love more like him. Or maybe if you're here and you're saying, no, my, my life is not, not marked by this love, then John's message to, to you is, this is Jesus' love for you even though you may not love in the ways that he has loved, and you have definitely not loved Jesus in the way that we should, Jesus loved us. He died for us, and he wants to change us. So for some of you here, maybe it's a call. It's called to give your life to Jesus. Start following him and be changed. If God is love, then everyone who truly knows God will love like he loves let me pray and get you guys out of here. God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you, God, for your goodness, for your grace in our life. God, thank you for the ways in which you loved us. I thank you that we got to come together today and we got to express our love for you in worship, sing praises to your name, lift you high. God, I thank you for the ways in which we've just come here to model you and to love one another well. God, that is what I pray that our community, this HSM, is all about. God, it's all about reflecting you in our relationships with each other, in loving each other so, so well. And so, God, I pray that today's reminder of what your love looks like compels us to, to love like you love, love like Jesus loved. God, I, I just thank you for this community. Thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for our time of worship. God, would you just be with each and every one of these students as they go throughout their Sunday and their week this week, and God, help them to see ways in which they can love other people in their schools, in their families, in their communities, and put you on display. 
It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey guys, one more reminder. If you guys are interested in the Mississippi trip, we got applications at the door. Go ahead and just grab one, even if it's interesting to you. And we'd love for you guys to send in one. With that said, we'll see you Wednesday.